Good evening. My name is Noah Rauch. I am the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's timely program, American Diplomacy in a Post-9-11 Era. As always, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our museum members and to those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. Recent global events have put a spotlight on diplomacy, both its efficacy and its limitations in advancing national and international interests. We find ourselves in an era when the relevance of post-war multilateralism has been called into question. Secure diplomatic cables are increasingly susceptible to hacking, and nationalism and isolationism are on the rise in many countries around the world. In the United States, recent years have seen a reversal of several long-standing and not so long-standing diplomatic stances and norms, while shifting global power dynamics seem to be reaching an inflection point. In the midst of this, more than 30 US ambassadorships remain vacant. How do we best navigate this changing landscape and what role does diplomacy have in these efforts? On the heels of the 74th session of the UN General Assembly, we are delighted to welcome two former diplomats to discuss these questions and many more. Unfortunately, Ambassador Newman was unable to join us this evening, and we wish him a speedy recovery. Peter Ramon served as German ambassador to the United States from 2011 to 2014, and to the United Kingdom from 2014 to 2018 after serving as State Secretary at the German Foreign Office in Berlin. In 2007 and 2008, he was appointed German ambassador to Paris. Prior to that, he worked as General Director General for Economics at the German Foreign Office from 2001 to 2007. His prior diplomatic career included, includes postings to London, Dakar, New Delhi, and Washington. During his recent ambassadorship in London, his agenda was shaped by the British Brexit referendum to leave the EU. And my last page is flown around here somewhere. He is, he is joined by Gerard Oro, a career diplomat. He is a former French ambassador to the United States and the United Nations, as well as Director General for Political and Security Affairs of the French Foreign Ministry. He is a trustee of the International Crisis Group. He previously held numerous positions between 2000 and 2014 with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Development, including serving as Ambassador of France to Israel and Permanent Representative of France to the United Nations. Over the course of his career, he has worked on issues from the Iranian nuclear program to the adoption of resolutions on Libya, the Ivory Coast, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali, and the Central African Republic, along with uh, participating in debates on the Syrian and Ukrainian crises. As you can see, we are incredibly fortunate to have these panelists with us this evening to share their insights and their expertise. With that, please join me in welcoming Peter Armon and Gerard Aro in conversation with Executive Vice President and Deputy Director for Museum Programs at the Nile Memorial Museum, Clifford Channon. Thank you, Noah. I would like also to welcome everybody, and uh, particularly our members. Our members are increasingly the core of these programs, and we're very happy to see them. For those of you who are not members, we have folks outside uh, who can make you members very easily. It's not very hard. Um, but, you know, when we were thinking about this program and talking about a program about diplomacy, I have to admit, we were thinking, oh, this is really sort of an easy, mild subject, and, you know, what could possibly be controversial about this? Um, and then news happens, and so we're very grateful to have you here tonight. Um, we will talk about current events, but, you know, as is our practice here, uh, you know, so much of what we do comes out of 9-11. And I, I, you were each in important positions within your foreign ministries back when the attack occurred. And I'm sure you have personal memories, but I'm interested also in your thinking about the 18 years that have elapsed since 9-11 and the impact as you see it of 9-11 on American foreign policy, as you've experienced it, as ambassadors from close allies of this country. So let me start with the end, Ambassador Amman. Well, Clifford, thank you very much for, for bringing us here. I, I'm, I'm deeply moved. I had the chance to see the museum for the first time just a few minutes ago, and I, I'm, I'm still under the impression, and I noticed that people with us seeing the museum, we, we talked only in whisper. This museum has enormous force. It radiates force. And I think you can be very proud of how you do it. And, and I've, I'm very grateful that you invited me. Thank you. 
short answer to your question, I think we, have to, we are going into a new era and 9-11 took us from one era that was the era of, uh, of uh, the end of history, maybe you know what I mean with this, yeah. to the era of a, f a fight against terror and nation building, wars in Afghanistan, Iraq and uh, other countries. And now this era again comes too close. And we are now in a new era where, uh, well, probably we uh, have to cope with bad experiences, mistakes, we, we, or, or maybe too high expectations we had when we entered into this era of uh, uh, nation building and, and war against terror. I stop here because I think I, uh, this might, might be a bit controversial, but it is uh, a point I would like to make here. Yeah, that's fair. I think 9-11 was, in a sense, uh, the end of our illusions about uh, the Western supremacy. Uh, basically, after the end, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there was a moment of triumph, of Western triumph. You know, we were defining the future of the world. It was the end of history. Everybody want, was dreaming of becoming a Western democratic liberal nation. And suddenly, with this incredibly brutal attack, uh, the answer was there. And, uh, and, and all the rest, what, what, what followed actually has amplified the message of 9-11, which means basically that um, the West uh, is not triumphing. Uh, there are countries, there are movements, there are individuals uh, who are convinced and who want to actually to roll back uh, the West. And, uh, and actually, we are on the defensive, you know, more and more. There was 2003, the, 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 the stupid invasion of Iraq, which was also on the West, was showing the hubris, the loss of the sense of proportions on the, on the, Western, on the Western side. And the other way, you, and the other side, you have countries which are back, China, Russia. Uh, so again, 9-11, I think for me, is the end of the Western illusions. Let me go to that because... You know, the response in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the invocation of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and then the deployment of NATO forces alongside the United States, your own countries as well, in Afghanistan, marked nonetheless the power of that alliance and the unified response. Um, very different in the response within the alliance and among the allies to the war in Iraq. How did you see diplomacy diverging at that point. What had been the unified response then became a very fractious and difficult period in the relationships, particularly between the United States and each of your countries, because you have described it in a particular way, the war in Iraq, but it was not something that either of your countries supported in terms of the American involvement there. So what was the effect of that on the relationships and on each of your countries' sense of what American diplomacy or foreign policy had become? <clears throat> well, I think when the decision to go to war in Iraq was taken, there was a clear disagreement on, on the analysis of the situation. Probably the, that's what I thought. Some Americans thought that, look, we had some very good experience after the Second World War. We defeated the Nazi regime. We defeated the, the Japanese mil militaristic regime. And after this came a perfect democracy and economic growth and so on, and a wonderful, a wonderful success story. Couldn't this story be repeated in Iraq? That, of course, Saddam Hussein was a horrible guy, and everybody should be relieved when he was gone. But the expectation was that after this, America could withdraw, or at least not be there fully present, and a wonderful story would start. And this wonderful story didn't come. It was a story of anarchy, of uh, tribalism, of civil war that, that followed, uh, outside powers uh, taking advantage of the situation, and the whole situation became really dangerous and messy. Uh, so this is, uh, the analysis of the Americans obviously was wrong at the time. Uh, well, maybe I, sh I should not boast of saying so, but we were a bit more, the French and we were a bit more skeptical about the, this um, American Positive analysis. Let me ask each of you, I mean, what was the impact in your foreign ministries, uh, not just of the disagreement, 
but of your sense that the Americans had made a miscalculation, made a mistake in this, how did that then affect your sense of the judgment of American foreign policy? No, first, I think it was a major crisis. Uh, it was really because uh, opposing the Americans, opposing American allies was not an easy decision. It was quite, I, I remember in the French foreign ministry, there was a lot of discussion, actually, and to, uh, and after, actually, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, we were submitted by, uh, to a lot of retaliation by the Americans, very petty retaliation everywhere. The Americans were blocking the French candidates. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and on the other side, we were overwhelmed by a uh, demonstration of support coming from all the world public opinion. Uh, but actually, um, very quickly, people forget that very quickly, there was a sort of um, reconciliation between France and the U.S. and I guess Germany and the U.S. because our common interest was to, to remain together. Uh, it was, we were working with Germany and Russia but of course, neither Germany nor France had any major interest or long-term interest to be with Russia. Our long-term interest was with the US. We are belonging to the same family. And as for France, the reconciliation came in 2004 about expelling the Syrians from Lebanon after the assassination of the Lebanese prime minister by the Syrian secret service. It was really so. I, I, I remember the meeting of George W. Bush and my president on September 20, 2004. Actually, you had the impression that it was a love story, that nothing had happened. The, the long-term interest was mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. to be together. How mm -hmm. conscious is the discussion within the foreign ministry of the calculation of the risk to the relationship with the United States and the disagreement with the United States? You talk about a reconciliation coming in 2004, because another incident allowed you to turn the page in that relationship. But take us inside the discussions within, let's say, the German foreign ministry about calculating the risk to the relationship and the value of the relationship with the United States. Well, the problem in Germany was that we had elections coming up and the public opinion was very, very critical of the American decision to go to Iraq. So uh, it was almost impossible for anyone running for, uh, for, 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 the, for the chancellorship to take a positive stance, but under the surface, among us, among the, the, the diplomats, the, uh, most people who do the, the, the work in the machine room, so to speak, uh, we all were very clear and decided this cannot go on. Let the election come and go, and then we will have to do what we can to restore the relationship with the US, because the transatlantic relationship is the core of our foreign policy. On, on our side, I, re I do remember that the diplomats basically uh, would have preferred that, who, of course, we couldn't support this, this invasion, which was illegal and geopolitically very dangerous. But we, our preference was not to oppose the, the Americans, basically to let the Americans do it. And it was a political decision by, by the president to say no. It's a, it's, it's a critical issue. We have to say no publicly. Actually, and I think that I eventually, I think that my president was right. But in terms of that calculation by the president, what was the argument in terms of the damage to the relationship and how you weighed that? The problem, again, very often, you know, in foreign policy, uh, as every, po every decision is a bad decision. It's exactly like in your private life. Uh, whatever you decide has positive and negative aspects, and you have to balance the two sides and say, okay, I'm falling on this side rather than falling on the other side. But if you are really thinking, uh, uh, you, if you are thinking, you can understand, you, got the, you could have fallen on the other side. So basically, uh, and my president, and it was the, poli the, political, uh, the political leadership, it's normal, uh, had the two sides, uh, the problem of the degradation of the relationship with, with the Americans. But the other side, there was, it was necessary to say, no, we can't declare a war, a war of convenience. It was really the argument on the French side. War is for self-defense or under a UN mandate. That was a war of convenience. War is not an instrument that you can use this way in foreign policy at your convenience. Ask about um, William Burns, who was a colleague of yours, senior American diplomat, now retired. Um, he's written about the militarization of American diplomacy, that 
uh, the State Department diplomatic approach has in recent years, and it's not just uh, from 9/11. It actually he traces it back to the extent the expansion of NATO, the expansion of NATO, um, and that as the Russians perceived uh, the threat from that. But he talks about diplomacy having become militarized in some sense in the United States. Is, is that a perception that would be related to your reflections on whether war in <laughs> Afghanistan, war in Iraq, or anything else since then? Well, the war in Afghanistan was a good war, and uh, Germany sent troops, or yes. is still sending troops there, and uh, engaged heavily uh, financially too. Um, we see the Americans, or as a diplomat, my experience with my American counterparts always was that it's, it was extremely difficult to negotiate with the Americans. I've negotiated with Russians, with, uh, with French, with uh, uh, Americans, and I always found the American partners more difficult, most difficult, because on the American side, it was uh, highly, uh, the, the relationship between the various departments was op op quite often very con conflictuous. And uh, when the Americans came to me and said, well, we have finally found a common denominator with the Defense Department or in any other department, and they said, please don't touch it. We can't really move any, any, any bit here. Yeah? This is something you wouldn't have with a Russian. Uh, we have a different style. I don't, I don't want to praise it, but uh, uh, for, as a, from a professional uh, point of view, it was much easier. Hmm. Was that your impression as well? well? That's something that everybody knows when you are negotiating <laughs> with the Americans. <laughs> Usually, when you are negotiating with the Americans, they, they come after three weeks. You know, you said we negotiate. They come three weeks later because it has taken three weeks for the interagency process, you know, to have reached a decision. And they arrive and they are exhausted and say, we can't change it anymore. So it's not really a negotiation, you know, <laughs> really, because the, for the Americans, negotiation is negotiating with the CIA and the Department of Defense, not so much with foreign countries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know where to go with that. Uh, um, you know, it, it does strike me, though, and we were talking about this before, that, you know, and you mentioned we seem to be in a new era, and whatever the 9-11 impact was, and it may continue in a variety of ways, but the sense of diplomacy in the world seems to have changed in important ways, and some of that has to do with the role of the United States. But, you know, we have this phenomenon in our country here, but in each of your countries. Brexit, dealing with it, uh, your role as the German ambassador in the UK. There's a, a nationalist current that is much more powerful than it was five, ten years ago, and seems to have had a great impact within all of our countries, and certainly in the relationships among the countries. I wonder how you see this in the context of more traditional diplomatic approaches. Is diplomacy up to the task of dealing with this new phenomenon? We have never been up to the task. So <laughs> really. Well, I would, I would say at least we should try, but, uh, but uh, a new era brings in a new form of, of diplomacy. And we have had uh, different forms of diplomacy in the past. For example, in the 19th century, we had what, what, what was called realpolitik. So uh, at, at that time, uh, the, the, the states uh, entered into agreements of convenience with each other. Uh, the, uh, um, these, these agreements, these treaties that were dominating the, or setting the scene in Europe in the 19th century were very uh, unstable. They were uh, treaties to balance power on the continent, for example, and then we, one day we could change again and then, it, when a war happened, as a consequence of this inst instability. And I think that we are going somehow a little bit back to this sort of thinking, because now the relationships between states or between governments are, are less value-driven as we were in the past, where we said, we were West, what, we, what, what unites us uh, is uh, our shared values, and that ke what kept NATO together for how many years now? 60 years? Or 70, 70 years. Yeah. Uh, now it's a marriage of convenience. If uh, Mr. Putin is of interest to country X, then probably we will enter into, a, into an uh, agreement with them. And so this whole thing predicts more instability in the future and more work for diplomats, of course, to, to keep these balls in the air, as Bismarck used to say. Hmm. You tweeted um, Ambassador Rowe after the, it was a 
celebrated but short-lived tweet after the 2016 election. Uh, you tweeted, after Brexit, after Trump, a world is collapsing. A world is collapsing. <laughs> yeah. And so this is the post-war order and the multilateral world. No, I, I, a world is collapsing. I, I was, and I was right, of, of, obviously, because after that, you wear the yellow vest in France. You had the Lega in Italy. Uh, basically, that was the world of the liberal democracy, the, the certainties that we had about liberal democracies, which were collapsing. Brexit, you could think it was an, an accident, you know, really, the, the usual vagaries of our British friends, but after, uh, and uh, that we love them. And, uh, and after, after Trump, it was not uh, possible anymore. And I was thinking of our own presidential elections in May 2017. So that was really something very, really the populist wave. Uh, it's something uh, very important. And it has consequences on, the, on diplomacy uh, because... All the populists, uh, yours and ours, are sharing basically uh, the same contempt or uh, lack of interest for shared values, for human rights, uh, for alliances, the same uh, leaning towards authoritarian leaders. And it's, it's striking because basically everywhere it's the same thing, the same hostility to the, against the United Nations and in the case of Europeans the case against the European Union. So you see suddenly, uh, you see a sort of, uh, in our societies, a new class of, really a new, you know, a new ideology about foreign policy, which is more or less the opposite of what it was. On the, the, on the external side, as I'm the Frenchman, I'm, I am in charge of the cynicism of, of cynicism. And, uh, and I love it because, you know, I have always been very, very skeptical about the idea of that NATO was about shared values. Actually, NATO was simply because a common enemy, the enemy of my enemy, uh, you know, really is my friend. And uh, because, you know, in 1919, the U.S. was engaged into the First World War and the U.S. didn't stay six months in Europe. The Americans left and, and left us uh, alone uh, to face uh, the rise of Germany against us. And in 1945, the Americans stayed in Europe, not because of they wanted to defend democracy, but simply because there was a common enemy, which was the USSR, and that France and Britain were not able to face this enemy. So we have always been in real politic, in, in balance of power. The only difference now is we were the big guys. We had, we, you know... Uh, uh, in France, we were calling the U.S. after 1990 the hyperpower. There was only one, one superpower. It's over. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it's over. We are now in a more balanced world. Uh, the West is, has lost its absolute supremacy. So what we call the West the end of the liberal order, there was never a liberal order. You know, ask to the Africans if they believe that there was a liberal order. Millions of Africans had died you know, really in these uh, supposed orders. There was six or seven wars in the Middle East. Really, no, there was no order. There was simply a world where we were the big boys on the block. We are not anymore. Sebastian Ramon, is that uh, no, response I'm, I'm, to that? I'm, 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 I'm more optimistic <laughs> than Gerard, um, but maybe I have to. Uh, but I would agree on one point. I think the uh, the new era that's, which starts right now, or maybe has started with the advent of President Trump, or may maybe even a little bit earlier, this new era uh, will probably be defined by the uh, fight for supremacy between the U.S. and China. So the relationship between these two countries will defi define the future of the world, and it will how it is played will be of huge consequences for all the others. For example, uh, this situation uh, gives Russia an enormous leeway to play. It can be sort of a junior partner to China, or it can offer his, its support to us in some way or the other. It can take all kind of, of it can exploit the uh, withdrawal of the West. We have seen now, as, as America has withdrawn or not, not engaged in, in Syria, uh, Russia is moving into this gap, and uh, right now Russia is, uh, Mr. Putin is holding a, a conference with all the, uh, with most of the African leaders, uh, 
because he, he feels or he sees that Africa is no longer of interest to, 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 to America. So again, here, uh, there's an opening. And he, uh, I think it's very, uh, very obvious how he, how he plans his foreign policy, Mr. Putin. He's, he's, he's opportunistic. Uh, he's a master of opportunism. And, and he plays this. And uh, so we can predict what he will do. And uh, now the worry I have is that uh, as, as we, NATO gets weaker, you will see opportunities also in the part of the world where I come from, in Europe. And uh, so far, NATO has been quite, uh, quite clear. We, we, we have said that in the Baltic states, where you have huge Russian communities uh, which might invite Putin, uh, we have said no. These countries belong to the EU. They belong to NATO. And to make uh, to underline this point, we, we send German troops, American troops, British troops to these and countries, French and troops. French troops. So as tripwires. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, so um, we have been very clear, and there has nothing happened there. It's all quiet on this front. The moment NATO loses uh, or the trust in NATO collapses, it does not even need a collapse of NATO as such, a, a formal collapse. But if Trust in NATO evaporates. Uh, Mr. Putin will have a new ball game. Well, let me ask you both about NATO itself. President Trump, during his campaign, was highly critical of NATO, focusing particularly on his sense of uh, the European allies not spending enough right. money, and so on and so forth. Um, the alliance and its supporters in the Congress have sort of rallied around, and and the president hasn't been focusing on NATO that much lately. He comes back to it occasionally, but. I wonder, in each of your views, do you feel NATO is in danger? Do you feel that uh, there's an American commitment that is enduring, or is this all up for grabs? Well, you know, first, I think, you know, really, uh, what I like in uh, President Trump, that very often he's raising a, a real issue, you know, in his own way, but he's raising a real issue. You know, the military budget of France plus Germany plus UK it's twice the military budget of Russia. So Russia is not USSR, you know, really. So in a sense, if you are an American citizen, you can say, why do we need to defend Europe? The Europeans, you know, basically, we have the, the, the financial means to defend ourselves. So I think it's a real debate that we should have between Americans and Europeans, uh, really. And because why, you know, in a sense, uh, the Amer for the Americans, NATO is also a way of uh, keeping its influence on Europe. You know, it's really nothing is free. There is not such a thing as a free lunch. And so there is a question. So why the Europeans shouldn't take their own defense into their own hands? We have the means to do it. So it's your choice also, the Americans. You know, really. So it's a real debate. And when the President Trump said, why should we defend Montenegro? To be frank, why? Should you defend Montenegro? What is the American national interest in Montenegro? You know, really. So there is a lot of questions which basically, in a sense, before President Obama and President Trump, there was a sort of conventional wisdom in the, the think tanks in Washington, D.C., you know, what President Obama called the blob or, and President Trump called the swamp. You know, really saying we should do it, we should do it. No, that's your political choice. I think it's a real question. Why NATO? Why NATO? Well, what, know, is really, what is the really, answer? What is the answer to that question? And I'm sure that uh, Germany has a very different answer from, from France. And the French say, the French, we say, well, okay, we are, we love, we, we are, if the Americans want to stay in Europe, why, why not? And we, we are good allies. We are spending a lot of money on our defense. But if not, the Europeans should be able to take their own defense into their own hand. And that's what we have been saying for for decades, yeah. yeah, but we were a lone voice. To be frank, we were a lone voice. But usually, the French, we love it. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, we were. We, the Germans uh, took the opposite stance and yeah. trying to keep America in. Uh, we still do, uh, and America, the American troops are mainly uh, in, stationed in Germany. Uh, I think at the height of the Cold War, you had five hundred thousand uh, GIs in Germany, and uh, uh, I think now you have thirty-seven thousand. I don't know how many we have in France. I think almost none. No, for, since 1967, there is not one yeah. American soldier in France. <laughs> so this, this is the difference. <laughs> um, yeah. 
but it's uh, the, the argument about the two percent target, which you kindly uh, didn't mention. The budget level, the yes. budget level. Yeah. NATO has uh, given an undertaking that every member should spend two percent of its GDP on on defense. Uh, the, the time scale was the timeline was not uh, very precise on mm -hmm. that. But Germany is not, and of course, uh, uh, the number of arguments came up in the public debate on, in Germany on this. One of them was that if we spend 2% of our GDP on, on defense, everybody will be frightened. Yeah, yeah because yeah. our GDP is, is higher than of our neighbors, and 2% and, uh, would probably uh, re, uh, re, uh, wake everybody up and say, oh, this is, this is, well, the old German problem is ra raising its ugly head again. Yeah. Well, we had Secretary General Stoltenberg here for the NATO Secretary General a year ago, and he was raising this question as well and defending the idea that NATO needs to spend more money and gradually, yeah. in some cases, it's been happening. And uh, if I just may uh, portray yeah, yeah. The, the, the public debate in Germany, the, the, the main point is that they say, what, what do we need, what kind of uh, weapons do we need and I remember, I myself, I was in, in the early 2000s, I was, as, as you said, I was the Director General for Economic Affairs. That means that I had to sign off all the export licenses. And it was a time when the Germans had about uh, 3,500 Leo II tanks, which are, we think, better than the M1A1. And uh, we, 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 we sold these tanks for scrap until we, down to 300. And I had to sign the, 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 the export of scrap to other countries, sign it off. And I, I was so shocked. I said, well, this is, um, this is just a waste of, of, of assets, what you are doing here, because these are wonderful tanks, and they are considered to be the best in the world, and, and we are selling them off at scrap value. Uh, and, and then uh, my opposite number in the defense department, in German defense department, said, well, yes, we, have, we, we think we don't need them anymore. And I said, can't you put them in a the garage somewhere and, and, and uh, forget about them? No, no, we, we have to look after them and oil them and keep, in, keep them in, in good shape if you want to keep them. So we, uh, we have to get rid of them. Mm. Now everybody is worried that we have so few tanks. Uh, well, uh, uh, the, the argument in the public debate in Germany now is that uh, if we now have again 3,000 Leopard tanks, this would not change the situation in Europe at all. What we, what, 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 we, what we are concerned about is Mr. Putin's behavior. Mr. Putin moving into Crimea, Mr. Putin uh, going in, uh, make, making the life of Ukrainians miserable in, in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, how can we stop him? Can we do this with another 3,000 tanks in Germany? We, we could not. What, what, what we can do is we can try to make his life miserable by putting sanctions on him. And uh, Germany is the biggest economic partner of Russia. In, uh, uh, and uh, when we say that, for example, certain trades are no longer permitted, when we say that uh, some oligarchs will not get a visa to come to Germany anymore, that we, that when we will uh, freeze their assets in Germany, we know it hurts them a lot. Yeah. So, by, 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 of course, we cannot do it alone. We have to convince the Italians and the French and all the others who also have some economic interests in, in Russia. And it took us uh, it, uh, an enormous effort, and we spent a lot of political capital uh, in, in Europe to convince our European partners to put these sanctions on, on, on the Russians, of which we know they hurt them. But this is the way we try to move Putin in a certain direction. But we couldn't do this with spending another 50 billion euros on tanks. Mm. Mm. Let me ask each of you, um, and so you're in London for the Brexit campaign. Mm. Um, what is your reporting back to your capital like? What are you telling them? How are you explaining what's going on? And likewise, I want to ask you about your reporting back to Paris after the election of President Trump and the America first mentality. So what does it look like to your characterization to your foreign offices back home? It's hard to say this in, in a few minutes. Um, Brexit happened for many reasons. Um, one central reason I, I, I discovered was that uh, society in, in Britain is deeply split, like the American society, like the French society, like the German society, like in Italy, 
it's, very, it's a strange disease that, 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 which seems to spread all over Western countries. And this split in society where people don't talk about each other. Here, um, I, I know of families in, in Britain who don't talk to each other anymore because one, is pro, one side is pro-Brexit and the other side is against Brexit. Uh, pe people are so uh, polarized that the, the center disappears and ex the fringes become more powerful. I think this, this, this pattern, this po political pattern, is at work almost everywhere in Western countries. And the tendency is that strongmen get elected. But, uh, you will have strongmen in, well, you have a strongman in America. Uh, you have uh, strongmen in, in Italy, Austria. Well, uh, in, in France, a new force came out of, out of nowhere. The old political parties in France have also disappeared, almost. Uh, and Mr. Macron is, is, is a new force that came out of, out of nowhere. So um, here we had some good news. Maybe it's a good French character that Madame Le Pen didn't win the elections. Uh, so we, but we were very close to it. Mm. I, I think there is a disease in, 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 in Western countries that, that splits societies, makes it more, more difficult to, uh, to discuss in earnest political issues, and which is supporting the, the creation of strong men, and strong men uh, have, uh, have a different foreign policy too. So how did you explain the America First movement to... No, first, I think that everywhere, as my, my, my German colleague said, everywhere you have the rebellion of 35%, 40% of the population against the system. 35% of the, our citizens are considering that the system is rigged against them and that they really say they are ready to toss the table since they consider they don't have access anymore to the table. Really, so the only solution that we have because the democracy can't work against 35, 40% of the population. The majority is not enough. The law of the majority is not enough. We have to respond to their anxieties, to, yet, to their resentment, you know, really. So basically, Trump, Brexit, uh, the, the Yellow Vest in France is this rebellion of substantial part of our, of our citizens. And, uh, and again, what they say, uh, we have to, to, to listen to them. You know, in America, after the election of Trump in, in Washington, D.C., I was meeting all the experts that you have in your country suddenly discovering the crisis. And, you know, when people tell us, tell you that 40 percent of the Americans have seen their income uh, more or less stagnating for the last 30 years, you know, really suddenly you said, what else? You know, really, and you had the crisis of 2008 on the top of that, the millions of Americans lost their home not a banker went to jail, you know, really, so what, you know, really, that's really, and basically in, in more or less the same terms, the same crisis, the same population which consider they have been victim of globalization. And, and, the, the, and so that you can leave this place uh, optimistic, actually the worst is ahead of us, because with globalization, with aut automation and artificial intelligence, Millions of jobs are going to be destroyed in the lower middle class, which is the pillar of our, which are, of our democracies. So basically, it's what I told Paris, trying to say, let's forget Donald Trump, let's forget the daily tweets, and let's look at what is happening in the American society, because usually when it's happening in American society, it's happening in Europe five years later. In diplomatic terms, America first means America alone. It's very striking that every time that we start, we try to work with Donald Trump, or with this administration, on, the, on an issue, it didn't work. You know, when my president went for the state visit in 2018, basically he told uh, your president, OK, we have a problem with China. Again, in, on this issue, Trump was, all, again, was the guy who said publicly what everybody was thinking or whispering. We have a real problem in terms of trade with, with China. Let's work together. And the answer of, tr of Trump was, no way. I'm settling my score with China, and after that, it will be with the European Union. <laughs> so, and, uh, so I know on a lot of issues, you know, America first means America alone. There is a, a basic contempt for alliances of history, shared values, and, uh, 
And when the British, after Brexit, will come to the U.S. to negotiate a free trade agreement, they will be treated like the Chinese. There will be, there will be British blood on yeah. all the walls. Well, the British, uh, I've wrote in, I can say this now because I've retired, uh, in one of my last reports I say the British have a, a choice. They will either become a junior partner of the EU or a junior partner of the US. What is the, you both described a fairly uh, critical sense of what's happening in the United States now, and these are internal uh, discussions you're having at foreign ministry level, but how does this translate to popular opinion in your countries and public attitudes towards the United States? I think in the end, uh, for the Germans, the U.S. represents the elder brother. You know, there's still, uh, you, you, may, you may fight your elder brother, but in the end, it, he, he's still family, he's still uh, the one you would look up to. There's, uh, you have enormous reserves, so to speak, of goodwill in Germany. And this doesn't uh, prevent the German media, some of them are really uh, fairly, we, we love pl to play this, uh, to, to show how critical they are and how em emancipated they are from America, and that, that uh, they are now standing for the, for the good values in the world. I think you can, you, this, this, is, uh, this is real, but don't take it too seriously. I think in the end, America is, 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 is the partner we, we want to have. Uh, there's no divorce. No, I think it's an important element. Again, I think how much I discovered that this, uh, this, with the election of Trump, how the, the Germans were, I should say, sentimental about their relationship with the U.S. Mm. Basically, the U.S. more or less created the Federal, Reserve, Federal Republic of Germany, you know, really founded, you know, this new Germany. So there is a really a, a very strong feeling between Germany and the U.S., and with, with the French, we are more relaxed, you know, really, <laughs> and uh, with our relationship with the U.S., you know, it's a, it's a roller coaster, you know, really, basically, we, we, are, we are the oldest ally of the United States. We are the only uh, G7 country which has never been at war with the United States. <laughs> but nevertheless, we have had very good family squabbles. <laughs> so it's, uh, we are very good at squabbling together. So in a sense, well, that's, uh, that's an American problem. But uh, we, we were really much less sentimental than the Germans about it, much more, much less shocked that the Germans were. Mm. Let me ask, we talk more now about very specific <clears throat> current diplomatic events. And one of the most recent ones involved France here at the United Nations General Assembly, President Macron and his effort to try to mm. broker a conversation between President Trump and the president of Iran, Rouhani, who was in the country mm -hmm. for the General Assembly. That didn't finally work, mm -hmm. but I wonder what you can tell us about the role of diplomacy and a more traditional approach to diplomacy that President Macron was representing and dealing with President Trump, who has, I think we can say the least, not a traditional approach to diplomacy. No, what, what we were uh, facing was uh, a strat an American strategy of maximum pressure against Iran, basically you have de your country has declared economic war to, against Iran. You know, the sanctions against Iran are devastating. Iran is going to lose 9.9% .9 of its GDP in 2019. You have to understand that basically no European company may go to, your, to, to Iran because basically the Americans are telling European companies you have the choice between American market and Iranian market. They don't hesitate 45 seconds, of course. So it's, it's, it's devastating. So basically you have, but why not? You know, dip, dip, you know, basically diplomacy is balance of power, twisting the arm of the weak is, I guess, the core of a good diplomacy. Uh, but, but the problem we've, we had is that if you twist the arm of the other side is to go to a, dip, a, a diplomatic negotiation at the end. You know, after that, you know, the Iranians are supposed to really and the problem with this administration is that there was no diplomatic path, basically, because in, in this administration, there is nobody who can negotiate, you know, really. Nobody has the mandate of negotiate, considering that the president considered that he's the only one to do it. So that gave the idea to the French president that since uh, uh, why let's not have a sort of a, a meeting or between the Iranian president and President Trump the way after all, Trump did the same with Kim Jong-un, mm -hmm. 
the North Korean. So why not let's let's have you know a meeting between the two presidents? Trump agreed. Uh, John Bolton didn't, uh, and John Bolton left. So really, President Trump was ready to to meet with uh, the Iranian president. But now we are bumping into really a diplomatic problem, which is on the Iranian side. Mm. Because the Iranians said, well, we go to a summit, but like in any summit, the decisions have to be taken before the summit. So we are not going to uh, really to be totally surprised. And it's all the more important on the Iranian side that the Iranian president is not the head of the system, is is not able to take the decision on the spot. Because, you know, he is, you know, the supreme leader and the political system be- behind it. So you, you have the problem that the French we have is on one side, there is the President Trump who says, no, I really, I am the negotiator. And, and, and the other side, Iranians really in a very traditional way say, we want to know what, what will happen the day of the summit. Uh, so that's the, the why for the moment we have failed to bring the two the two, side, uh, the two sides together. Do you think this is an ongoing effort that might bear fruit? Yeah, it's an ongoing effort because really there is something very, very specific about President Trump. He doesn't want war. And that's really something, you know, he's not a neoconservative, he's not a George W. He doesn't want war. And that's a very, very strong feeling. And secondly, he, he doesn't have any limitation in the fact that he's ready to, to, to meet the devil. You know, he really doesn't care about human rights, democracy. He met Kim Jong-un and says how great he is as a guy. So he may, he may now he may meet anybody in the world. So that's something which we, we, are, try, we are trying to, to play on that. But the other side is, as he is not a real diplomat, he is not ready to negotiate, he wants to do everything by himself, on the Iranian side, we have a real, a real problem. They, they are afraid of sending their president you know, meeting Trump and uh, with no preparation uh, uh, whatsoever, which doesn't fly very well in the Iranian system. So what does this do to foreign perceptions of dealing and negotiating with the United States? If, if there really is no structure and no system behind high-level decision-making in this country, what does it mean for people whose jobs it is to implement policies, negotiate about differences and that sort of thing? Well, this is the high art of diplomacy uh, to cope with such a situation. But I just w- want to end uh, to throw in one thought on the Iranian problem. Uh, you, you rightfully said that Mr. Trump does not want war. I, well, I'm happy he doesn't want war. But uh, this message is, has well arrived in the heads of, uh, of the Saudis, of the Iranians, of all, all the people in the Middle East. And what you see now is that the Iranians, for example, believe we can test the Americans. We can find out how far can we go. So we put some mines on some, some, some tankers, blow them up, shoot down a, a drone, nothing happens. Uh, and now we are, we are go- trying to find out how far they can go. And you should also look at the domestic policies in Iran. Uh, someone who who, who dares to challenge the U.S. and g- gets away with it, is a great hero. Yeah? So uh, the Iranians are exploiting this situation, yeah? which is, of course, not to everybody's yeah. liking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is diplomacy by tweet in any way related to any traditional practice of diplomacy, or can it coexist with diplomacy as you have practiced it and as diplomacy has existed for centuries? No, it, it's obvious that really basically things have dramatically changed, uh, that uh, the tweet, uh, the tweeting president, your tweeting president is, I think, uh, is opening the way of other tweeting politicians. I think that no politician in the future um, will really, will, will not, won't think of it, you know, because it's a very good way of going over the head of, of the press, of the, the, the traditional press, to talk to your constituency. So really, uh, and also the social media are there to stay. You know, really, when I was a young diplomat, the question was basically to look for an information which was rare. And now the problem of the young diplomat is to, to make a selection about a sur- uh, an overabundant information. Mm. 
So really, so things are, are, are changing, changing very quickly. Also, our societies don't accept the top-down approach. They want <clears> to, <throat> to be part of the, of the conversation. Um, so we have to invent a new, uh, we have to invent new diplomacy. Uh, there is a problem, there is a problem, because uh, <coughs> diplomacy, it's very difficult to de negotiate and uh, and in a transparent way, you know, well, that's not possible, you know, really, because if you negotiate, you make concessions, and you don't want the concessions even immediately revealed to your own public opinion. Uh, any mm -hmm. a negotiation is based on ambiguity, and ambiguity is possible only if it, there is no, not too much transparency. So it, there is, an, uh, there is a, uh, uh, of course, there is a disconnection, maybe a collision, but at the same time, uh, we are democracies. We are not going to get rid of the social media or the, the, the demand for transparency by our, from, from our citizens. So the, the, the diplomats have also to change their mind, you know, we have to, to change their way. Uh, they have to be more, I guess, more open. Uh, but again, it will depend also on the country. You can be quite open in the US. As an ambassador, I was tweeting a lot. Uh, if I was ambassador to China, I would have only tweeted about the castle of Versailles and, or about French cooking. But, you know, <laughs> really, which would have given me a really a wide range of, of topics, uh, but uh, not on, on politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when I was in, in London, I, I, I held back. I did not use, I, I, I tweeted on German cooking and... Uh, uh, and <laughs> which and, was very really quick. And, 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 and uh, <laughs> German sports cars and, uh, and, and uh, German soccer players, which was uh, quite successful. But I didn't dare to really uh, become part of the debate on Brexit in the public. Of course, yeah. yeah? Because, again, uh, knowing how Germany is seen in Britain, the, the Second World War is not so far back in their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, so immediately uh, I would have, would have to face some very ugly, uh, ugly comments. So I, I did my traditional diplomacy and uh, tweeting uh, with a nice thing. So uh, I, there is, of course, an episode of American diplomacy in the news uh, that we've all been talking about lately. And I, I want to ask you each to reflect on these conversations that our diplomats have been involved in between Ukraine and the United States, and not so much on the details of the case, speak to that as you wish, but from the professional point of view, is this as unusual as it seems to us? Has some line been crossed here uh, that we recognize, but that looks different from where you sit as professional diplomats? <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a diplomatic answer. I've never seen such a thing happen in our system. <laughs> no, it's, you, you know, it, at the same, really, we are living in a time where nothing is, is, is remaining secret a long time. Uh, you know, really, you had the WikiLeaks and you had, and, and again, you can say it's always coming from the Americans, but... Uh, it's also, I think, the reflection of our societies. Uh, leaks are something that you really you should expect, and uh, so it means also that when a president is talking to another president, he has also to take into account who is on the other side of the on the other side of the line, whether he can rely on his discretion or whether he can't. Uh, but I think that more and more we are going to see such incidents. Uh, down the really uh, again transparency and and leaks and 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 social media it's so easy now you know really through social media to leak much more easy much easier than it was uh, 20 or 30 years ago uh, so again uh, once more I believe that uh, Trump is opening the way yeah and why not uh, I, uh, I remember when WikiLeaks came out someone mm. Uh, phoned me and said, oh, look here in WikiLeaks, where is a telegram the American embassy in Berlin wrote, or, or the ambassador, the American ambassador in Berlin wrote about a conversation he had with you. Well, we would certainly be interested to read it up. And uh, yes, I, I, I looked it up. And it was a report on a conversation I had on a very technical issue with him. It was nothing spectacular, but it was a, a, a point to be negotiated. And uh, I said, well, in the end, the American ambassador portrayed my viewpoint very, very well to the State Department, much better than I had formulated it myself. So I was very happy. 
that's taking the bright side of, uh, of leaks. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's... You each mentioned, you know, this tendency towards strong men in our politics, and you used President Trump as an example of it. So the conversation that we're talking about with the Ukrainian president is in some form a conversation of strong man to strong man or strong man to would be strong man or strong man to someone he wants to be a strong man on the other side, that they can decide something outside of the system. And I'm just curious as to how that fits with diplomacy. Is this diplomacy contradicted? Is this diplomacy that would shrug its shoulders and go along? How do diplomats fit into such a circumstance? But, you know, diplomats, we are serving uh, our bosses, you know, really. So, um, so I don't see the problem, you know, really. Basically, we have a president uh, or we have a political system and uh, we're implementing a policy. From time to time, we are disapproving the policy that we are implementing. Uh, you personally have always said when I was disapproving, but after that I've always implemented in the most loyal way I could. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is the, the diplomats, we are not creating policies, we are advising and implementing. But there is a political level which, in, a, in our democracies, which is taking the, the, de the decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, we are discussing before the meeting the resolution on Libya, you know, really, uh, which was basically a Franco-British endeavor, and uh, I implemented it, you know, really to my, uh, to my best. But uh, I had my doubt about this policy. I still have my doubt about the policy. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very diplomatic way to turn to the audience for questions. Um, we have some microphones here, so I will ask gentleman raising his hand in the middle there. Wait, just wait for a microphone, please. Thank you. Merci. Danke. Uh, if diplomats serve their bosses, as you so properly put it, and in the event that, and there is a distinct possibility of Britain eventually rejecting Brexit, is it a world where we could possibly see the, the realization of Jacques Delors' old dream about the European Union, that it become a strong player even more than it is today. We, we don't know the EU in this country like perhaps we should. And uh, do you see, for all of these reasons, not a weaker EU, but, but a stronger one and, and one that more relevant than ever? I think it depends on how dangerous the world around us will get. Uh, form follows function. If, uh, uh, if the world really get, becomes more aggressive, more dangerous, then I could imagine that uh, Europe will get its act together and, and create a European army, for example, which is uh, debated right now. Yeah. Uh, if the world stays like it is, I'm, I'm more skeptical. I think there are enormous centrifugal forces in Europe today, and uh, there are fault lines which, go, which crisscross uh, the EU. There's a fault line between north and south uh, in in, in short term, the southern uh, countries are, uh, are hoping for a more lenient uh, monetary policy so that, that governments could spend more, whereas the northern countries try to be more uh, austerity-minded. There's a division between west and east. You, know, you have m maybe heard of the Visegrad states, the East European countries, uh, that have a different view on certain well, human rights and, 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 and uh, the uh, implementation of, uh, of judicial st structures in their countries. So uh, there's a, there are st fault lines that become more visible uh, the bigger the EU gets. The, uh, the EU has expanded enormously in, 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 in the last, uh, uh, well, in the first 10 years of the, of the 2000s. And entered into a f another 10 years of crisis uh, management uh, in, in the second de de decennial. And I wonder what, 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 what is happening in the, in the, in the coming, in the t 2020s now, uh, before us. Uh, as I said, if, if the outside world stays more or less docile, I think we will be very busy with ourselves and we will not see much progress. Hmm. No, I think the European Union uh, is and will remain a major power on a lot of issues which are the most important issues for our future, climate change, 
but also privacy, you know, and uh, privacy, the management of artificial intelligence, the, the, the fight for biodiversity, the negotiation on trade, uh, which are actually the real issues, you know, rather than the Russian tanks. That's a real issue for our future. And the European Union is the right framework to handle these issues. And, you know, for instance, privacy, it's very in interesting, you know, privacy on the exchange of data. Uh, we have a strong policy and a little bit, the U.S. didn't have, but actually more and more, the high tech companies in California are adopting the, the European standards because there is no American standards very Really, so they are. They really. So we are. We 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 are defending. We have a multilateral vision of the world. We are defending it. And on the on a lot of issues, actually, uh, multilateralism is the only way to handle the issue. As I've said, climate change, biodiversity, uh, the future of the oceans. You know, it's not a question of France or Germany or or Malta. It's really the the, the European Union. So on that, we are a power, a major power, and we remain a ma major power. The question of, of army or defense, I'm skeptical, frankly, that we can do it because uh, basically there are l l some European countries which are not ready to do it. You know, really, frankly, Germany, uh, with a, a military budget of 1.3% of the GDP and, and the public opinion, the German public opinion, is not favorable uh, for, uh, to, for, for a military, an active military policy, you know, really. And when the French want to, to go to Africa, a lot of European countries consider that they are neo-colonial adventures, uh, uh, are. you know, really. And uh, so they consider it neo-colonial adventures, while we, we in the South, we simply consider that Africa is, around, is across the street. So again, and uh, so that's, that's I, I should say, and I agree with my colleague also, of course, if the dangers coming from outside are growing, Europeans will be obliged, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, will be obliged of, of, of really going maybe into a, a stronger military structure. Or if the Americans are leaving, you know, really Europeans will feel obliged to go to a military structure. But uh, for really for the moment, short of this, of, of this uh, constraint, uh, I, I'm a bit, a bit skeptical. Yeah. Another question. Right up front. Hang on one second for a mic. With the U.S. continuing its max maximum pressure on Iran and Iran getting more aggressive, do you think the JCPOA will survive? Uh, again, I, I really... The JCPOA was a very good agreement to monitor and limit the Iranian nuclear program. It was never intended to solve the other issues raised by the Iranian foreign policy. And when uh, arrived the Trump administration, the, the, the three Europeans, Germany, UK, and France, we went to, to negotiate with Trump, the Trump administration, to, to handle these other issues the missiles activities, terrorism, regional activities, and there was a negotiation going on, and we were at 85%, 90% of an agreement. And suddenly, in, uh, really, in, uh, President Trump uh, really basically denounced the JCPOA and swept away the negotiations that we were conducting with the Americans. So now we are to square one. Without the JCPOA, the Iranians can simply do whatever they want on the Iranian scene. So far, they have been quite restrained, and they have really basically increased their program in a very incremental way. Uh, but to be frank, now there is no limit, you know, really, so it's, it's dangerous. And uh, we wanted, by a through the GCPOA, to avoid the alternative of an Iranian bomb or bombing Iran, really, mm -hmm. and that was a good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So now, again, it's, uh, are we going back to the GCPOA? Um, if the Americans are not going back to the GCPOA, the Iranians won't be back, it won't be back, and the Iranians will incrementally be more and more provocative on the, on the, nuclear, the, on the nuclear side. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the test question is, is uh, Israel, is Saudi Arabia, are the other states in the region safer without the GCPOA or with the GCPOA? And I think the answer is quite clear. They are, they are less safe now with, with the GCPOA in, 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 in the doldrums. Um, and as you said, Gerard, there was the, the point around 
2005, 2006, uh, when uh, clearly the alternative was uh, bombing of Iran or, uh, yeah, or what? GCPOA. It was the alternative. Now, GCPOA is, has been destroyed by Mr. Trump. Uh, so is, is the bombing now imminent? imminent, is it, or not? If it's not, then of course uh, the situation is, uh, is, is different from 2005, 2006, because we could have had this situation earlier. Yeah? We tried to prevent, we, we, I think the Europeans in the game, tried to prevent a, uh, a situation where, where war was, which was really moving into war. And, uh, well, now, now this block has, is, has moved, been moved away, and uh, I don't see uh, how this situation in, in the Gulf can be resolved. This, there's a program running. The computer is programmed for war. Who else? Gentleman right there. Uh, do you think there's uh, any way to resolve the Afghanistan conflict through diplomacy? I don't know if you talked much about Afghanistan today, but I'm just curious about your thoughts. Well, we've tried for how many years now? Uh, 18 years. And uh, I, I, I remember that we, uh, well, we Germans had a budget of about a billion uh, euros a year. Uh, to spend in in uh, Afghanistan, and some good has been done. There have been some schools for uh, girls built, and the uh, the education system has been has has been improved. There is some result uh, from all these eff these efforts, but of course, uh, the, the society in 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 Afghanistan is still divided as it was along tribal lines mainly, uh, and uh, so uh, if. Uh, now we call it, uh, well, we, we bring it to a situation somehow similar to the helicopter on the Saigon embassy. You have this picture still ahead of you. Uh, America is go going away and don't counting the cost. And uh, if, if, we, if, if we are repeating this, this scene now, then all the money, all the uh, human uh, sacrifices are, are wasted. I think that's my, that's my analysis of today. I think we, when we went with the Americans to Afghanistan, to be frank, we were quite skeptical. We went there, in a sense, out of solidarity after the 9-11. Mm. You know, remember the discussions in Paris. First, there was the idea of saying, what is our national interest in Afghanistan for the French, really? And secondly, Afghanistan, you know, everybody was remembering 1842 uh, destruction of the, the British army, 1879 redestruction of the British army, you know, really this country which has never been conquered by anybody, the Soviets, the way the Soviets were also defeated. So really, we didn't have a lot of expectations, but nevertheless, we consider it was necessary to show solidarity with the Americans by sending our, our troops. Uh, and we have been from, and actually we left, I guess, before the Germans, uh, we left in 2012. You're still there. Uh, you're still there, mm -hmm. exactly. And we left in 2012 because we consider that basically we are going to nowhere, really to, and, uh, and now there is a sort of a race between the American negotiator and Donald Trump because Donald Trump wants to bring, bring the boys home and uh, and on the some and on the up to a point you can understand it after 18 years what is the what, what really what is the really the why to stay two three four five more years what what is going to change so so again i i i'm i don't know what diplomacy could do you could be uh, you could be again it's my role here you could be cynical and saying that up to a point it's the problem for the russians the indians the chinese more than for the Americans and the, and the Iranians Indians, Indians. and the Iranians and the Indians, uh, the Pakistanis and so on. And to say, ladies and gentlemen, we did our job. Now it's your problem. And it could be a major problem in terms of security also for the Chinese, for instance, or the Russians. You know, really, you could also do that saying it's your problem. Why should we go there? And I think it was also the feeling of, the, of President Obama. 
If President Obama didn't withdraw the forces from Afghanistan, it was because he had withdrawn the forces from Iraq and there was ISIS. Suddenly there was the upsurge of ISIS. So he couldn't, the U.S. administration, the, the Obama administration, couldn't afford having, you know, this sort of crisis in Iraq and also in Afghanistan. But uh, very often I emphasize when I want to wake up my liberal friends saying, you know, really, on the, some issues, it's not so different, Obama and Trump in foreign policy. Both men have understood the fatigue of the public opinion in this country to be the policeman of the world. Ukraine, it's not Trump, it's Obama who did basically nothing and outsourced the crisis to the French and the Germans. Syria, it's not really Trump these days, but basically is following the, 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 the lead of President Obama. So it's really, I think it's a trend, and I'm convinced that whoever will be elected president in 2020, basically we are not going back to the American leadership and the Americans leading, you know, really playing the role of, of the uh, policeman of the world. Of course, there will be nuances, and nuances are important in diplomacy, but I'm not, I don't think that, for instance, President Warren would be really willing to engage the U.S. again into military operations, and, mm. and President Biden neither. Well, this is both frank and diplomatic <laughs> in its tone, and I, um, I think we should um, join me then in thanking our guests. This has been a wonderful conversation. Ambassador Peter Aman and Ambassador Gerard Arrow.